they said you're the 80, actually 82nd interviewer of me. Okay. Hi, I'm Tim Naftali. I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. Today I'm in Naples, Florida, and I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing Becky Beck Lavelle. It's uh, September 22nd, 2008. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bovell, for contributing to the Richard Nixon Oral History Program. I'm delighted to be a part of anything that has to do with the Presidential Library. Uh, how did you find yourself in the White House? In 1971, I was working in the United States Senate for the senior senator from Colorado. My roommate had, a few weeks earlier, departed that office for the White House to work for Charles Colson. I received a phone call one day from my roommate asking me if I would be interested in a writing position at the White House. Well, naturally, this was my uh, potentially my second job at age 25 or so, and I jumped at the chance. I uh, went down, had an interview, was asked to join the staff at the White House, and suddenly found myself in the midst of the most powerful building in all of Washington. Um, help the uh, the viewers. Who who was the senior senator from Colorado? Senior senator was Gordon Allott. He was not a household name. However, he was a very powerful senator, in that he had nearly 18 years of tenure. And being a Western senator, he was the chairman of the Interior Committee, and also of the Appropriations Committee. Furthermore, he was the chairman of the Republican Policy Committee. So as I say, whereas he may not have been known um, as a household word, uh, he certainly had a great deal of power in Washington. What did you do for, for him? Uh, it was my first job out of college, and I worked for the press secretary at the time. And subsequently, I worked for George F. Will, who became a staffer for Senator Allard. Oh, George Will of? Of Pulitzer Prize Pulitzer, yeah. fame and columnist, yes. Oh, tell us about working for a young George F. Will. George came from, uh, at the time I believe he came from Illinois, and uh, the senator hired him to write his speeches. And so I moved from the press secretary's desk essentially over to work for George. And um, he is arguably one of the most brilliant, articulate wordsmiths of my generation. And he is also a tremendous fellow in terms of having a great personality. He is a die-hard, lifelong Chicago Cubs fan, so he must be very happy this year. And uh, we became very good friends and have remained uh, friends over the years. Um, uh, was it <laughs> Normally when you write speeches for uh, a political leader, you have to um, imitate their voice. George Will has a very distinctive voice. Um, did, uh, do you remember having, uh, because you were working for him, did you, do you remember having him uh, rewrite a lot because the, the senator didn't quite want to sound like George Will? Well, you have to remember that this was quite a few years ago, and George was just coming into his own. He was not a, a national personality as of yet, and so he was feeling his way as well in terms of developing his political instincts and his writing style. He had no column at the time. He was not associated with Newsweek. But I think that what he did was collaborate with the senator and try and steer the senator in a direction, um, perhaps, in which he had not traveled before. And he, he influenced him with his views. But I think that, at the time, um, George was not quite as um, conservative or vocally conservative as he is now. So, uh, you, you get this op opportunity at the White House, what's your job there? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, again, to put this into context, when one is 25 years old or so, and you're thrilled to be asked to join the staff of the White House, uh, I can recall not being very particular at the time as to what I was going to do, although I was promised that I would be doing writing, which was what, what my skill was at the time. So I was put in an office in the, at the time, the old executive office building. And I was told that I would be working for a gentleman who, quite frankly, I would not see all that often. That he would leave memos, 
he would leave instructions, he would call on the phone, and uh, my office or administrative functions at that time would be to follow to his, his uh, path, so to speak, in terms of what he was working on. I did not know who, who he was at the time. This did not last very long, and again, it's been so many years, it's difficult for me to reconstruct entirely. But I do know that after a period of approximately one month, I was no longer working for him, and I subsequently did find out who he was. Even though I never came face to face with him in the office, his name was Howard Hunt. And they didn't give you the name, they didn't tell you who the man was? They just not, said a man? Not to my recollection, they did not. Now, you may think that sounds pretty strange, but again, um, I had never worked in the White House before. I didn't know what the protocol was, and so I followed directions. So you were told that somebody would leave something on your desk? You'd never see him? They didn't say I would never see him. They said it was unlikely that we would cross paths because if he had different hours and he traveled quite a bit. So you would just uh, find something on your desk? Yes. And did you in that m month that you were working I for did. I did. I found memos that needed to be completed. I found a research that needed to be done, things of that nature, more of an administrative role, which again uh, was not what I was led to believe that I was going to be doing in the White House. So my um, limited recollection is that I probably went to uh, Richard Howard, W. Richard Howard, and suggested that this was not what I had in mind, and I subsequently moved on. And to what? Uh, I worked for Mr. Colson for a while in an, a capacity that involved some writing, some construction of, of memos, some policy papers that I was given direction on. And again, that didn't last too long before I moved to the correspondence section. Well, love to, before we move to the correspondence section, uh, remember that you're, the audience today is an audience that uses word processors, computers. Uh, this is a very different era we're talking about. Yes, it was. Tell, tell us a little bit about how, how memos were pre pre prepared. Well, we had typewriters. We did not have computers. And we would receive um, information from various sources in a notebook format. As an example, if there were a subject at hand that was receiving quite a bit of attention at the time, we would probably have a number of different paragraphs or um, ideas as to how the president at the time wanted his wishes or his, his views conveyed. We would then construct either a memo or a talking paper or a white paper using those guidelines. And they would be done on the typewriter manually and they would be passed along for further review by uh, people in higher authority and they may, might or might not come back. Uh, I have an interesting anecdote about memos in, during that period. Um, some of your viewers may recall the name uh, Bob Haldeman, for whom Chuck Colson worked. And we were all told, um, upon being hired, that the worst possible scenario would be to receive, or for Chuck to receive, a memo back from Mr. Haldeman with the um, in his own handwriting with the phrase TL squared. TL squared meant too little, too late. Hmm. So that's not something that Chunk wanted to see on his desk. So you had these paragraphs in, in this notebook form, you said? We did. We had them in, in uh, a variety of forms, but certainly, as you suggest, no computers. It was all done by typewriter, handwritten notes, uh, typewritten notes, just the way you would function during that period of time. You also had, um, how would you make copies? We had copiers. I mean, you, it you, wasn't that long ago. No, no, but, um, <laughs> but, but you had copiers, but you also, didn't you use the, when you typed? You mean uh, carbon paper? Carbon paper. Yes, Wasn't we did. Yes, we did. It made things much more difficult when you wanted to correct a mistake. But actually, that we weren't using carbon papers, as I recall, as much as we had a new type of typewriter that you could erase. It had a backspace functionality mm -hmm. to it and, and white tape so that if you needed to make a correction, you could do that without carbon paper. 
So we were a little bit beyond that. Um, when you shift uh, to the White, White House Correspondence Unit, was that in the East Wing or the West Wing? That was in the West Wing. Uh, most of it, however, uh, there was a portion in the West Wing, but my office was in the old Executive Office Building. Okay. And most of the correspondence unit was. If I recall at the time when I joined that, I believe the staff was somewhere between 125 and 140. There were several different sectors, we called them, of the correspondent unit. It wasn't one single room. Mm -hmm. There were various sectors which um, had to do with the type of correspondence that we were working on. There was a policy section, and at that point there were only six of us. There were six writers who worked on policy papers. Again, uh, information that was given to us by people in higher authority. We kept notebooks. If there was a, an issue of the day, that changed quite rapidly, and we re received new information, and we would construct and develop the correspondence accordingly. The other sectors included um, the mailing section, the children's section, which was quite interesting. There was a very large staff in the children's sector because um, children from all over the United States love to write the president. This seems to be a, um, uh, a task that teachers like to assign to elementary students. Uh, let's write the president and find out what he likes for breakfast, what he wears, does he have dog, does he have a cat, does he have children, anything and, and anything and everything they would like to know about the president. So of course when you have um, approximately 300,000 letters coming in per day, you have to have uh, a system whereby you use some form letters. And we did that and so did the, the Children's Correspondence Unit. I can recall one instance when actually President Ford was in the White House and he uh, got a new dog and he named it Liberty. And people were fascinated with this dog and we had to develop pho photography of the dog. We put the actual paw print of Liberty on the photograph as if he had signed it and we sent out hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those to children all over the United States. Did you do anything for King Timaho for Nixon's dog? Not that I recall. I did see King Timaho quite a bit because the, President Nixon had an aide, uh, a lifelong aide I believe, whose name was Manolo. Mm -hmm. And Manolo used to come to our offices quite frequently and bring the dogs, three of them. King Timaho, which belonged to the President, was given to him, as I recall, by the staff, uh, an early staff. And secondly, Julie Nixon Eisenhower had a dog, and Trisha Nixon had a little poodle. And so Manolo used to bring the dogs, take them for walks, and he'd bring them in the offices, and we'd visit with them and play with the dogs occasionally. But um, Julie Nixon Eisenhower was very interested in the children's correspondence unit. And I recall that one time she had broken her leg, uh, had an accident of some sort, and she was upstairs in the in the uh, family quarters and she really was kind of laid up and had nothing to do and was getting quite bored. So she figured she might as well find something to do. So she came down to each day for quite a while and worked in the children's unit and she loved it because she was very, had a fondness for children and subsequently I believe wrote a number of children's books. But uh, she enjoyed uh, reading what they had to say and, and responding to the, to the questions about her father. Um, which which section did you did you you worked in the children's section for? No, I didn't. I worked in what was called the message or greeting section, and that was called that because uh, there was one other sector that I didn't mention earlier, and that's the congressional section, mm -hmm. and that had a, a staff of its own who responded to congressional requests of the president. Obviously, um, congressional. Uh, whether it be senators or congressmen, want to respond to their constituencies who have asked favors of them um, about the president. So if they wanted a, a particular letter sent to a constituent, they would ask through the congressional unit at the White House to have that sent out. But I was in the message unit, and what that meant was 
there was a tremendous amount of correspondence that required um, messaging in that we wrote uh, in response to constituents who wrote directly to the president and were asking questions about various policies that he had, what, whatever it might be. And we had to, again, develop the responses accordingly, depending on what was the issue of the day. We also had a sector within the, the messaging sector which responded to greetings. People love to hear from the President and the First Lady. And so if you had a 75th anniversary, you received a card. And we had to, the, the, excuse me, the requests were so, uh, there were so many of them that um, the White House had to set guidelines as to what, who could receive greetings and who could not. Otherwise, we would have, we would have never been able to leave our offices. So the guidelines were set that if you celebrated a 50th wedding anniversary, you would receive a greeting card from the President and Mrs. Nixon. If you had a 75th or higher birthday, you could receive a greeting from the President and the First Lady. And there were other occasions, depending on whether or not the President was very familiar or whether the correspondent was a friend or a close acquaintance of the President. And of course, we responded differently to those types of requests. I don't know if anyone has mentioned to you about auto pens. Uh, no. President Nixon, and he's the one that I'm most aware of since I worked for him the longest, had three different sets of auto pens. And what that does is it's obviously it's impossible for any president to sign every piece of correspondence that w goes through the White House. It's physically impossible. But yet, every piece of correspondence that goes through or is sent to the White House to the president is answered, every single piece, unless they're, it's a, of a threatening nature in which that's handled completely differently by the Secret Service. But. As far as the auto pens go, President Nixon had three. He had three distinctive signatures, and they were very meaningful to him. The most formal and the signature that appeared on most of the correspondence to people, the public in general, was Richard M. Nixon, as you would suspect. That's the most formal signature. The second one was R. N. Circled, and that was a very personal response from the president that he se selected who would receive that type of a signature. And there was a third that was signed Dick with slashes on either side of it. And that was the third. And oftentimes the R encircled was personally signed by the president. Not always, but oftentimes. So those were the three different elements of signatures that were available uh, within the White House during the Nixon administration. How, how were you alerted to who was on which list? Were, were they, these lists actually printed up? No, there weren't any lists. But when the correspondence came down from wherever it originated, and, and you have to picture a correspondence unit there, there were many, uh, there was a process to the whole thing. Every letter has to be read initially to determine what route it's going to take. And if it's a child's letter, it obviously goes to one direction. If it's a policy issue, it goes another direction. And oftentimes those, uh, certainly the children's, was signed the in the formal way. Uh, the others had to be identified by different people um, in positions higher than mine as to how they would be signed. And sometimes we didn't even know how they were going to be signed because we prepared the responses, got the correspondence ready to go, and it went back to another central uh, sorting area and the decisions were made at that area because they were labeled as to what type of correspondence they were and the decisions were made elsewhere as to how they would be signed. Very interesting. Um, the most Was the most familiar, uh, I suppose the Dick, when, when he wrote Dick, that was the one for his closest friend. That's right, that's right. Um, how long did you do this for? 
President Nixon? Well, I began in August of 1971. I flew to the White House, actually, on Air Force Two to take a job. It was just a coincidence. I had been, I was leaving, as I said before, the Senator's office. I had not had a vacation in quite a while, so I flew out to Utah to visit my parents. My father was the commander of Hill Air Force Base at the time. And coincidentally, the President Nixon's Secretary of the Treasury, who is David Kennedy at the time, stopped at Hill Air Force Base because he was Mormon and he was from Utah. So he stopped briefly to visit with his family. My father had a brief conversation with him and told him that his daughter was starting work at the White House the next week. And he said, please, ask her to get on board. We have plenty of room. So uh, I was able to fly back from Utah to the White House, or to Washington, D.C., actually, on Air Force Two. That's quite a way to start. It was. I uh, met quite a few Secret Service agents on that trip and eventually married one. <laughs> Who was on that trip? Who was on that trip, yes. <laughs> wow. Yes. So you have, uh, you have the Treasury Secretary to thank. <laughs> <laughs> but it, was an, it was certainly an interesting trip and a nice way to begin my career. But uh, as far as how long I was there, I started again in August of 1971, and I stayed throughout President Nixon's tenure and also throughout um, President Ford's, and I left shortly after President Carter took office in February of 1977. And you worked in the correspondence unit right through? Yes, I did. Well, let's, oh boy, let, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about, uh, from your perspective from there, how Watergate evolved I mean, as it began to sort of uh, uh, consume the presidency. Talk to us about what you can recall. We were watching the television hearings, as was everyone else. Most of us had televisions in our office. And as the process unfolded, we were as consumed and, I suppose, surprised as anyone else as to what was going on. We were enthralled. Um, we had absolutely no idea what was transpiring, so it was unfolding for the staff in the same way in which it was for the general public, yet it had a much, it was much more impactful because we worked with these people daily. We knew who they were. Of course, we didn't, I can speak for myself, I had no idea and most of my colleagues had no idea what was going on. We were finding out daily. Um, as something was revealed on television, we learned about it at the same time. Uh, the longer the process went on and the more people who testified, the more stunned we were. And I guess it was a feeling of apprehension. It was a feeling of, in, s in some aspects, betrayal, and in some aspects, relief, because we wanted to know what, what was going on. We, you know, we had a we were vested in, in this job and, and in our livelihood, and we didn't know where it was going to go. And quite, quite frankly, there was a palpable tension in the White House among all staff during that period, and it was a very difficult time. Um, where were you when the president resigned? Well, I remember it vividly because, uh, as you may I'm sure you're aware of, the day before, or he announced the resignation in the evening, and then the next day he a assembled all of his staff in a room. And that speech was televised, and I stood in that room with many of my colleagues, and I listened to what was a very, very difficult speech by the President and he seemed to wander about. His thoughts didn't seem to be too cohesive. He spoke at great length about his mother. I remember feeling very badly for his family because it was quite a lengthy speech. And we stood there and stood there and kept expecting it to end, but it kept going on and on. And I remember having a particular empathy for Mrs. Nixon because 
with all that she had been through and stood by him all those years and through the latest um, incidents, not one word was mentioned about her, and I felt badly for her for that. It was He focused mostly on uh, his past and his mother and his upbringing. Did, did um, the First Lady ever come by the correspondence unit when you were there? I don't recall that she did, no. Was there a separate section for her correspondence, or was it Yes, handled? her correspondence was handled entirely in the East Wing. We had we only worked on the President's correspondence. Tell us a little bit about what you remember of the transition from the Nixon to Ford White House. What, what happened for someone like you in your position? Well, the other thing that I remember about that day, the morning, of course, was the speech that we just spoke about. Following that, we went out to the South Lawn. Most all of the staff was on the South Lawn when the President and Mrs. Nixon got onto the helicopter and waved goodbye. Of course, President Ford had been sworn in at that point. And I just remember standing there, and as I had so many times on the South Lawn when visiting dignitaries had come in, it was always, no matter how long you, you work in the White House, and time goes very quickly, you don't realize how quickly it passes. I was there for a um, little over seven years. And as I stood on the White Lawn, uh, excuse me, the South Lawn, and watched him lift off for the last time, the thing that struck me was how seamless it was. We had a president leaving for the first time in history who had resigned, and another president was moving into the Oval Office. There was no coup. There was no bloodshed. There was no argument of any kind. It was amazing. And we all talked about that. We were, again, in somewhat of a state of shock as we went back to our offices. And I, I can tell you that was a long day that we sat there. I don't know that it was a very productive day, but we just wondered, you know, how was this going to work? And um, subsequently, President Ford sort of led the way in that respect. I honestly don't recall which day. A day or so later, I think, maybe two, he came by and he went through all the offices, as far as I know. And he just popped in for a moment and shook our hand and said, asked our name, what we did briefly, and said, just don't worry about things. Things will be fine. So he was very encouraging, and he helped kind of bridge that gap of uh, that. It was more than a gap. I think at that point it was more like a chasm. <laughs> we, we didn't know what to expect. But he was very helpful in, in just that brief moment that he stopped in and said that uh, things were going to go along fine. What, no, what uh, changes did you notice in, in the work of the, of the correspondence unit under President Ford? Well, of course, if you, if you take the context into which he assumed office, it was a very volatile time because it was not a popular decision after he pardoned the pres President Nixon. So we received, the White House received, tremendous amounts of correspondence, both pro and con, about that decision. And we had to be very mindful of how difficult a decision that must have been. And we were also mindful of the fact that we prob he probably knew that that was going to cost him dearly, that decision, but nevertheless, he felt it was the right one to make, and I think history has, has vindicated him in, in terms of making that decision as well. But the correspondence quadrupled. And at the same time, and I don't recall all of the details, but the economy was moving toward a recession, or if perhaps we were already in it. And he um, had a program that involved, uh, I think, victory gardens and things of that nature. Win, whip inflation now. That's right, that's right. And so that created a tremendous amount of correspondence as well. So we were very, very busy. And actually, life went on. I mean, we had, we had had this major transition from one man to another, yet it was, as I said before, somewhat seamless in terms of the work that we're actually doing. A different signature was being applied to that correspondence, of course. But I still, to this day, 
am amazed at how smoothly and how effortlessly, effortlessly it, it happened. Was President Ford's uh, policy on the auto pen the same as President Nixon's? Obviously, the name was pretty different. much the same. Yes, I I think he, he didn't have three. I don't believe he only had two. Um, Gerald R. Ford, and uh, I, I think the more familiar, just Jerry. Um, uh, what about now? You said the correspondence quadrupled because of the pardon. Yes. Uh, did that and that, that, that didn't continue? That was, for it. that was true of any major issue, but this was pretty significant in that people were not happy about this, and then there were the supporters who felt that it was absolutely the right thing to do. So we had twice as much on both sides, essentially. Do, do you remember how the how the response was written? Those those particular letters. I honestly did not. Tell us a little bit about the letters that President Nixon was receiving in the last few months. Um, were they getting more and more critical? Or what, uh, what? I mean, uh, did you did you weigh them? How would you? Uh, because I'm, I assume that somebody wanted to know uh, the direction that letters were going in, right? Wouldn't they take a survey? Or? They did that constantly. Uh, the press office did that. Um, we reported the numbers for various, any issue. In that particular issue, I'm sure we did the same thing, pro and con. Um, I can't, after 30 years, I cannot recall the numbers. But I know that we did have very explicit language that tried to educate and explain the president's decision. Oh, you asked about Nixon. I'm sorry, I moved yeah. ahead. Um, I was thinking about as the president's explanation of Watergate changed over time. Right. How you dealt with that? Well, the the correspondence, as you can imagine, was there was a um, a wave of correspondence that was in what I would call the disappointment pile, if you will, uh, people who had tremendous faith in what they thought the president had done and could do and they felt that he had uh, not lived up to that trust. So there were those kinds of letters. There were also negative letters as you would suspect. And then there were the letters that were encouraging him to stay and continue and um, see this through. So there were, it ran the gamut. And uh, do, you, do you remember how those piles changed over time? Well, unfortunately, the, the request for resignation um, grew larger and larger. And I think, people, I think people felt that it wasn't, in my view, from what I read, it wasn't as much that they wanted the president to leave as it was that they felt that for the good of the country he had to if that distinction makes sense to you. It's, it wasn't as if they were saying, um, just, just get out of the White House. It was, it's, it's time that this stops. We, we, the country can't take any more of this. That's, that's the way I felt. Um, when you were writing and working on these, these greetings and other messages, um, how did you see the way that the people, what role did people want the president to play in their lives? Not necessarily President Nixon, but any president. Because these people actually. I think people actually take the president very personally. They've either cast a vote for him or against him. And they have high expectations, those that have cast that vote for him. And they expect that he will live up to those expectations. So I think there's sort of a personal relationship with the American public and whoever is sitting behind that desk at the time. And I, and I feel that his partner, his wife, no matter who she is, fits into that mold as well because there are certain expectations of the two of them and how they act together or separately. And if the president doesn't follow a path that 
his public expects, there is a level of, of disappointment. And it's, people take it personally. I don't think that you go into a voting booth and make a, a selection as important as that and then just turn away and say, well, let, we'll just see how things go. They've got a vested interest in, in knowing that he's doing his job right. And, they, and being in correspondence, I can tell you that they don't hesitate to express themselves uh, on any level. So uh, that's what kept us very busy. No, no doubt. Um, just to change gears a bit, um, Washington, when you were there, was a, this was a time of demonstrations, a lot of tension about Vietnam, not well before the, Viet the Watergate issue. Do you r recall uh, when, when the big demonstrations occurred in Washington, and were you ever concerned about your safety or security? I recall that very well. Um, in actuality, I was not concerned for my safety. We were in the White House, after all. It's about the safest place you can be. It was disturbing, however, to look out the windows everywhere and see them. And I actually had a personal... Um, a personal stake, if you will, in this. My father was at the Pentagon. He was an Air Force colonel who was deeply embedded in the Vietnam process, as it were. We had a red phone in our home, and I was dating the head of Harvard Law Review, who was out marching in the streets. Now, I can truly say that I was somewhat ambivalent at the time. I was doing my job in the White House. I was quite young. I was not ultra-conservative or ultra-liberal. I was just happy to be doing what I was doing, and I, I felt very badly for the folks that were in Vietnam, Vietnam, and I didn't like the war, but I wasn't of the mind to go out and walk in the street, uh, especially with my upbringing being uh, an Air Force, daughter of an Air Force officer. So that, uh, that was a very poignant revelation for me to watch what happened and watch the relationship that I had at the time deteriorate as a result of politics. Um, what was his name? Pa Phil Bakes. And, uh, and he must have, in, before it deteriorated, he must have kidded, kidded you all the time. All the time. And it, and it worked out pretty well for a while. He would do his thing, and I would do mine, and we didn't let it get in the way. But eventually, it, it had to. And uh, Phil Bakes, if you don't recognize the name right off the bat, um, the story goes on and on, because I know you've interviewed uh, Charles Colson, and several years later, um, Phil Bakes became one of the lead water cube Watergate prosecutors. So the schism that started with the two of us got even wider. And I didn't know that he was one of the lead prosecutors, even though he had interviewed my roommate multiple times, had deposed her uh, because she was Chuck Colson's personal secretary. And when we went to court for Chuck's sentencing and I saw who was sitting at the prosecution table, it was uh, quite a shock. Um. And what was the, your roommate's name? Holly Holm. Holly Holm. Um, so your relationship uh, with, with Phil Bakes was in the fall of 71? I actually met him uh, in the, the first summer that I was working. No, I met him in the Senate. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, he was working for a congressman during the summer, and I was working for Senator Allard. And it uh, continued through uh, about the first uh, year in the White House then. That was the end of that. When the demonstrations uh, were in full swing, we separated. Um, one casualty of the <laughs> political system. <laughs> one of many. One of many. Uh, tell us about how the how the climate changed uh, under President Ford. After the initial period of adjustment, mm -hmm. when staff realized that life was going on, people were not losing their jobs, uh, there was a continuity 
that was healthy and it became evident that we were we had we had reached a comfort zone and people have asked me in another way what you've sort of asked me asked me how it was different under president nixon as opposed to president ford and truthfully i always had the feeling that president nixon was in solid control of everything from foreign policy to domestic policy. Now, history has proved us somewhat wrong about that, but nevertheless, that's the feeling that I had, that he was a very strong leader, personality, and um, understood foreign policy in particular to the depth of which many other people did not. Um, as much as I think of President Ford and the way he handled the situation into which he was thrust, I never had quite that same feeling of confidence while he was in office. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, who would, uh, would you write any of these messages? How did you, what, what actually, what role did you play in, um, you know, day to day? activities in the message unit? I, um, as I mentioned, I was one of six, and we responded to policy papers. We were not speech writers, but there were, on any given day, a variety, hundreds of different issues which generated a typical type of correspondence. And we were assigned by an, another gentleman whose name was Roland Elliott, Mm -hmm. We were assigned um, different topics or multiple topics. And the six of us would then, bearing in mind the guidance that had been provided on particular uh, issues, and when I say guidance, it might have been a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. It certainly was an entire letter. But the thrust of what the president wanted to convey was, was given to us, and we crafted the correspondence around that. So that's what we did all day, every day, on a variety of topics. And they were sent back to Roland Elliott, and he more or less signed off on them. And then they were sent to another sector of the White House where they uh, were signed and sent out. Or they were returned to be redone. We didn't always get it right. Which, uh, which sector dealt with responding to letters about Watergate? We did. We all did, the six of us. Almost everybody did, except for obviously the children's unit. Even the congressional unit had to respond mm -hmm. in kind. Um, so it was, and that was, as you can imagine, a changing scenario, depending on the most recent testimony. If after Alex Butterfield re revealed that there was taping going on in the White House, we had to respond to that. Um, after Rosemary Woods lost footage from the tape recorder, we had to respond to that. So there was a changing scenario, and it was changing quite rapidly, particularly toward the end that we had to do. And, um, and again, time has dulled the memory, but uh, I do remember that it was a bit frantic. And, and was it Roland Elliott would just tell you what the new would give you the new sentence or the new explanation. That's right. And there was a uh, woman who worked very closely with Roland. She was in the White House for many years. I think she remained even through President Reagan. Her name was Ann Higgins. I don't know if you've heard that name, but uh, she was part of the correspondence, um, oh, uh, uh, an authority figure in the correspondence unit as well. And there was another person named Mike Smith who was I believe Roland's boss. Now you stayed through the part of the Carter administration. I was. Um, I stayed through the the very end of the Ford administration, and I was actually planning to leave. My husband at the time, the Secret Service agent that I mentioned before, had been transferred from Washington to Miami, Florida. So I was leaving because of that, and because I was uh, I was 
not prepared to work for Jimmy Carter. But I stayed with the transition to help with that. I felt it was only fair to help with the transition to any new administration that comes in. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the choices for staffing that President Carter made were not the wisest in my opinion because he hired many family members. He hired many people to do jobs such as mine with no writing experience or no experience whatsoever. Um, I believe he hired one of his son's roommates to take my job and at that point I was pretty high level in terms of a policy writer. I received a call, I, I left uh, I believe in February of 78 after he was elected in 77 and moved to Miami and I received a call about six months later from the White House asking if I would come back and take my old job back and I declined. Well by that point what, what were your responsibilities? I mean you'd been at this job for a number of years. What had you taken Roland's? Were you actually in Roland's? No, I haven't. I did not take Roland's. Uh, Roland actually, um, unfortunately, became very, very ill with a life-threatening disease. And this was at the very end of the administration. So um, the people that I mentioned before, Mike Smith and Ann Higgins, were sort of taking over for him. And we were, at the same time, taking on more responsibility in terms of crafting the messages, because we pretty much knew what to say by that time. How were women treated in the correspondence unit? Absolutely fine. We had uh, no issues in terms of gender at all. And interestingly, the six policy writers were all women. We, we reported to one man, but we were all women. Um, can you remember some policy issues that you enjoyed writing about, and responding to, I mean, letters that were fun for you to write? Oh, boy. I know it's been a long time. It has been a long time. There's just so many. Um, I had missed, um, I was hired in, as I said, in 1971, so I missed President Nixon's trip to China. And even though I was not there during that. Well, you were there for, the, you were there in, in or 72, though. 72, yeah. I'm trying to remember. But I remember writing about that as well, after the fact. And that was such an amazing accomplishment that I do, I do remember that. You how missed, important you, that was. You missed the, the announcement of the secret negotiations. That's right. But you were there when, when he actually went, went to China. Uh, and I, um, I'm trying to think what else. It's, it's very difficult to remember. There were so many issues. I wish I were, had a better memory. No, no, no. You had a very good memory. Uh, um, do you, uh, um, do you recall did you, oh, and, yes, I was going to ask you, 1976, did you, were you surprised that Gerald Ford lost the election? Not at all. Absolutely not. I, I knew that was the price he was going to have to pay for the pardon. I think he did as well. Um, he did what he did, and um, I think it was the only solution at that time. It healed the country. It helped people get past it, and I, at the time, saw no other way to do that. And uh, I believe that he's been, his decision has been vindicated. Even he was honored by the Kennedy Center. Tell, do you remember talking to your colleagues when the news of the pardon came out? What did, did you all agree in the correspondence unit? You'd been working with these people for some time by then. The people that I worked with, my colleagues, we agreed. Because we, we had been on the inside watching this and watching the... Um, what it could have been a very destructive time period had this been allowed to move forward with trials and, and you know, anything that could, could have and would have happened if that pardon hadn't occurred. However, my friends and uh, people that were never involved in the actual hands-on political uh, jobs disagreed. They, they did not think it was the right thing to do. They thought that the process should be carried out. But then later on, 
years later, some of those same friends have, have said, you were right. Uh, not just me, but that was the right decision. Now, these were friends. They weren't all they were Democrats and Republicans? Oh, yes, both. both. So it was a more of a generational thing? And I was actually not a Republican. I was hired as, I was an independent, and I was hired, but when someone offers you a job in the White House, I, I, as I said before, I was somewhat ambivalent about politics at the time, at that age. So I wasn't, you know, just dying to work for a Republican president or a Democratic president. It just was a great place to work if you're going to be in Washington, D.C., and you're at the heart of, of all of it. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was a tremendous experience. Well, I'm... Um, have we have we missed a, an anecdote that you'd like to put on the record? Um, I can't think of one. I think I. You could you could follow the Phil Bakes trail a long ways, but uh, uh, he. Um, Subsequently, became president of Eastern Airlines. He worked for Teddy Kennedy, and wrote the legislation for deregulation of the airlines. Mm. So he's had quite an interesting history. We we now have reconnected with friends. He lives in Miami. Oh, great! He actually got into the tourism business, which is where I am now. So it's kind of uh, uh, a twisted path that we've followed. Yeah, well, the politics of have been muted Diluted, over time. Diluted, yes, yeah. yes. Um, and we talk about it. We talk about it. After yeah. all these years. And Do you understand each other's point of view yeah. better? Yeah. Seems to, seems to be less of, uh, well, I think as you age, you, uh, you mellow somewhat. And your views are tempered. Um, do you remember uh, participating in any events of the inauguration in 1973? Yes, I, I was there in the crowd, freezing, and uh, watched the speech. And uh, I had another interesting experience before that in that, I believe it was that inauguration. We were privileged as staff members sometimes be invited to rehearsals in the East Room of those entertainers who were going to be um, featured during the president and the first lady's events during the evening, whether it's the inauguration or anything. And one of one of the most uh, delightful experiences was I was able to go and listen to the rehearsal for a couple of hours, actually, uh, of Frank Sinatra. So I was from here to there to Frank Sinatra and listened to him sing for what he was going to perform that evening for the president and many dignitaries. Was, was that uh, was that the the evening event that he did in the White House? Yes. I think he did it for the Italian leader. Is that what it was? Yes, oh, I um, didn't in 1973. Wow. So you actually listened to the to his his rehearsal. How I many did. people were with you? Oh, uh, uh, a handful, probably ten, twelve, something you, like that. He was rehearsing in the East Room. Yeah. Uh, did he did he take uh, uh, any uh, uh, any recommendations? That, no, <laughs> that he really he did, didn't. He requests? really wasn't conversant with us. He was concentrating on what he was there to do. We were just quiet and watched him. Was he, uh, it's been a long time, but was he, was he actually wearing his tux when he was, uh, No, no he wasn't. Uh, rehearsing? Um, last oh, question. Yes, I'm go sorry. ahead. No, you, no, go You ahead. asked about an anecdote, and uh, I don't know if um, Chuck Colson mentioned this, but he, any, anybody in that type of a position who worked directly with the president, which he did, and had had a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the president. It's a very stressful job, no matter what the circumstances. But we always laughed because Chuck has a very good sense of humor, and even though he had a reputation for being somewhat arrogant and somewhat stern, that's really not how he is in person. And we used to kid him because on his desk he had a giant, I mean giant, about this big, um, container like a candy container but instead of having candy in it he had Maalox so he kept that on his desk all the time <laughs> to share or just no I think he it was for it. him <laughs> we didn't we didn't use it oh by the way when when old blue eyes was uh, rehearsing did he smoke did, did yes he did 
to not to a smoky in East Bay. And I don't know how old he was at the time, but he was past his prime. Let's just say that. And his voice, it was evident in his voice, and he had gained quite a bit of weight. So it was a different Frank Sinatra than what we expected. Did you ever meet Richard Nixon? I never did. No. So he didn't pop his head in and visit no. the correspondence unit? No, he didn't. He didn't. Did you meet the First Lady? I did. I met her once uh, at a reception in the East Wing for the staff. Very lovely and very kind to all of us. And I did meet Mrs. Ford as well. She did the same thing. She had a reception for staff. And then I have already mentioned that her husband came around and talked to us. Uh, I've seen these uh, uh, Christmas cards. Do How did they choose the um, style of the White House Christmas card? They oh, were that's an interesting uh, story, too. When I was in the messaging center, as opposed to one of the six policy writers, um, we had the responsibility for mailing the President and the First Lady's Christmas cards out. And ha as to how they determined the list, I have no idea, but we were given the list. And we had a large group of volunteers, mostly ladies, not 100%, mm -hmm. but mostly, who loved to come in and work in the White House. And they would come in and they would help with those cards that I mentioned, the birthday cards, the anniversary cards, whether it's a baby birth or w what have you. And they would ad hand address. Everything was hand addressed then because that's the way the president wanted it. So they would come in uh, every day of the week, a different group, and they would hand address those cards that would go out by the hundreds of thousands. And when it was Christmas time, or well before Christmas time, and the Christmas card had been selected by the president and the first lady and had been duplicated, they would send it to our unit, and we would have the volunteers write them. Well, you can imagine the temptation for these ladies who were addressing Christmas cards for the president, but yet they wanted to send one to their friend or one of their relatives. So we had to keep a very close watch to sh make sure that they didn't put little notes in or try to write something on the back, like, hello, Helen, this is from Carol. <laughs> but it was, it was amusing. They, uh, I, I, did, uh, they never used the picture of the president and the first lady and the snowman, did they, for the Christmas? No, actually they picked artwork for the most part. President Nixon's selections were, as I recall, things like a courier and Ives print, um, artwork de that depicted Americana. And I actually have a couple. I, th I believe I said I'd donate them to the library. Um, and President Ford picked pictures of other presidents such as, n n and I, I can't remember the, the order, but I, I know I've had pictures of, of Adams uh, hanging in my house or uh, uh, Washington or s Lincoln, I'm not sure. But there was a series of those, and then there was the Courier and Ives types, but it was artwork mostly. These were paintings that were done by, by American artists uh, in large part. They were not pictures of the president or his family uh, ever. Did either president, uh, did, did they get a few of these cards to write something in? I mean, would the first lady or the president write oh, a little sure something? Oh, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did to their personal, very close personal friends. We didn't have anything to do with that. It was just a huge list of people that I don't know who developed that list uh, that they needed to send cards to. Well, Becky, you've been great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. And, uh, I've enjoyed it, too. Nice Thank reminiscing, even though it was so long ago. <laughs> PJ, thank you. Darren, thank you. Thank you.